So uh, good morning, uh, or good morning, I guess, to everybody who is uh, west of me right now, and good afternoon to everybody to the east. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I am thrilled today to have with us Erica Keswin, who is a best-selling author, uh, much in-demand speaker. So Erica, thank you for being with us today, especially um, the week you've published your latest book, I think the, the day after. Um, Erica is a, is a person of such uh, varied talents and accomplishments through the course of her career. I think it's, it's difficult to encapsulate them all in one introduction. Uh, so I will cheat a little bit and borrow some of her words. Erica is an individual who professionally has connected people, connected people, connected ideas, connected organizations, and really dedicated her career to the idea that people can transform the effectiveness of businesses, of teams, uh, and is also, I'm happy to say, a very close friend of Jen and mine, someone I can personally attest has a virtuosic ability to uh, bring people together, uh, spouses, she has a number of, of marriages to her credit, uh, friends, um, and, and organizations. Uh, she, is, she is someone who argued early and, and quite effectively that, that the things we regard as, or used to regard derisively as the, the soft side of business uh, are actually you know, deeply important and determinative of successful outcomes. And she's a person whose career has been uh, uh, littered with successful outcome after successful outcome. I'm not just talking about her three amazing kids, but she was uh, early in her career, a consultant at Booz Allen and the Hayes Group, where uh, she really helped transform businesses, then went to work on the, the more personal um, side of, of connection uh, at Russell Reynolds, and then as an executive coach at a number of organizations, including uh, NYU's Stern School of Business. And uh, then after spending uh, um, some time here in Colorado and, and, and a moment at the Aspen Ideas Festival, which I know many of you know we've, we've supported and worked with over the years and many of you have been to, um, uh, she realized you know, it was a moment to bring her ideas to a larger audience, published uh, the best-selling first book, Bring Your Human to Work, which was about uh, workplace relationships and connections. Uh, and as of just yesterday, published um, Rituals Roadmap, which we have here, um, and uh, I would see on your sweater, um, which was, uh, you know, it's, it's just an outstanding book. I think you all have copies of it. Uh, I was reading it with, with Jen last night, and she was, she, was, she was going through it page by page and saying, you know, you should do this, you should do that. So we have, we have, we have more ideas than ability to execute right now. Um, but that is, that is really one of Erica's great talents. Um, she is in so many ways grounded in the theory of organizations and how they operate, the behavioral psychology, the organizational psychology, but she's able to take those ideas and distill them into things uh, that are truly actionable, right? And, and that we can um, use, and I think, I think relevant for many people on, on this call, uh, we can use to, to bring together our teams and, and advance um, the causes of the organization, you know, the values we have, um, and, 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 and the purposes we, we seek to serve. And she's, she's, she's really outstanding at that. And you know, as I was saying uh, to her before we got on, I think this could not come at a more relevant time. You know, we're in this watershed moment where we are all rethinking what work means and how we work and how we connect, not just with our customers, but, but with each other. Um, so I think you know, the, the, these are principles that are relevant on any day, but, but, but in, in 2021, uh, I think particularly so. So we're excited to have you one note on, on um, how we do this before we get going, um, which is I, you know, we'll, we'll um, as per usual, we'll talk for, for a little while, but we have time reserved at the end for all of your questions. So please submit questions in the Q&A bar on Zoom and we will, we will get to them at the end because we want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so with that, um, you know, uh, Erica, thank you again for being here. 
and um, and uh, let's uh, let's let's start uh, with Rituals Roadmap. So it was published yesterday. Uh, in your first book, you focused on workplace re relationships. Why don't you take us through how you came to workplace rituals for the new book, and 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 why you saw that as as so important and kind of the logical next step in your work. So yes, thank you for having me, and and it is amazing. This is the big first event after the launch last night, so I'm really excited to to dive into this with you. After I published Bring Your Human to Work, I didn't, you know, set out necessarily to to write another book this quickly. And I guess I have three kids. I know you have four kids, so I equate it to to childbirth, where you. You know, you forget some of the really hard and awful parts, and then you go back to the well and do it again. So what happened was I was out to dinner with a friend um, and now colleague. Ironically, we were out at our monthly dinner. We go to the same Italian restaurant every month, have a big glass of red wine. So there's some irony that this idea was born during a ritual. Um, it's funny, she's coming to visit next week, and we're going to try to go back to our same restaurant outside if, if it's not snowing. And we were talking about Bring Your Human to Work and the feedback that I had been getting. And one of the things that came to me in that dinner is that when I think about all the stories in that book and all the leaders with whom I spoke, there was a common theme, which was many of them were employing rituals. They were using rituals as a tool to create a more human workplace. And that might've been in the way that they had meetings or in their CSR practices and how they gave back their well, you know, focus on wellness. And literally it was one of those, you know, light bulbs. If, if someone had been, you know, if there was possible to see my yeah. head in that moment, I would be like, oh my gosh, you know, this, this really is a connecting point. And that's when I decided to begin to investigate and learn as much as I could about the science of rituals and that the impact they have, again, on us as people, but also on our business. So what, talk a little bit about, you know, rituals as a concept. So and ground us there. What, what distinguishes a ritual from, you know, a routine or a habit or just, you know, something you need to do every day? Where, where, where does it become a ritual and, and, and why is that? You know, why is that so effective, you know, for kind of who we are as people in terms of connecting us? So I think it's an important place to start. Um, so because there are many, many different definitions and opinions about mm -hmm. what a ritual even is. So the definition in the book, there's two pieces of it. One is that a ritual is something to which we assign a certain level of meaning and, and value to it. It's something that we give our intention and it's something that happens on a regular basis with a certain cadence. You know, it could be once a week, it could be once a month, it could be once a year. Um, and, you know, we'll get into some of your rituals. I know we, around recognition and some others that I'm sure happen at those, you know, certain type of cadence. I was actually at the opportunity on Sunday to be on MSNBC talking about the inauguration rituals. And we know that that happens every, every fourth year. Um, so that's a piece of it as well. The second yeah. part though is equally as important and, and really was interesting to me. A ritual is something that goes beyond its practical purpose. So yeah. what do I, you know, here's an example. I'm sitting in my apartment in New York City and if the lights were to go out, which they very well might because mm -hmm. we've only lived here for a week. Um, if yeah. the lights were to go out and I light a candle, that's not a ritual. But if I light right. a candle every Friday at five o'clock to distinguish and highlight mm -hmm. um, you know, the end of the work week for me and the beginning of the weekend, and I'm again, assigning a certain level of meaning to that, it's almost this elevation of this routine yeah. into something bigger that is a ritual. Right, and, and, and is rituals in, in, in that sense, are tend to be born of you know of of some routine that we have um, that that serves a purpose, but but then gets elevated beyond that. So I mean, you you talk it, it, it's interesting because you talk I, I in your book about and I often think about it in my mind about you know two ideas. One you know we're very familiar with athletes, for example, right, who have who have you know rituals before. Um, you know, before they perform or, or performers who have rituals, right? 
Um, and, you know, but then there's, there's a broader set of rituals um, that of, you know, companies, you know, and you give a lot of examples of use to, to you know, live their values or, or connect people. Do you see those as sort of different strains of, of the idea of rituals, kind of these, these individualized rituals and, 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 and group and, and, you know, give us some sort of examples of, of, you know, that you talk about in your book about, you know, rituals that you think have, have the, 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 the most effect in, in corporate cultures. Um, okay, so a lot of parts to that question. First, I would say on the athlete side, I think it's interesting. Um, and I think all of those examples that you gave are, they're, they're related um, in terms of their different kinds of rituals and different takes on rituals. But to me, they, they all fit under that umbrella. So let me give an example. With the athletes, let's say, you know, there's a basketball player that is going to bounce the ball three times before, you know, he or she gets on the court. You know, there's no practical purpose around that. Um, yeah. and, but that's something that, you know, he or she does and, and, it's, and it's a ritual. The flip side, though, is let's say um, there's a certain order in which you, you do your warm-ups for the game. <laughs> That's yep. more, that, that's more connect. And you know, I mean, you could talk about that because you're, um, you know, a better athlete than, you know, most of us on this call, if not everybody, but that, that there's certain, there might be a certain order that you need to warm up your muscles to get ready to do an Ironman. You know, that's yep. not a ritual that's saying, okay, here's a program and this is what it does, um, for our body versus, you know, the bouncing the ball, the three times that is not related to your, to one's athleticism, but, but it is there is a higher level of meaning around it for the, for the basketball player. Mm -hmm. um, the same goes true in, in corporate America, that many of these, the, the rituals um, serve, and we can talk about the, the ROI of rituals. I mean, why are they important for us as people and for, for business? And I'm happy to share some of those, those studies on it. Um, but, but many of the rituals at work are the same, that there's no real practical purpose. So one that jumps out, well, before I say one that jumps out, the way that the book is structured, I'm so excited and thankful that, that everybody's getting a book, is for, on the corporate side, I look at it from the perspective of the employee experience. So if you're a leader, you know, a manager in this organization, think about rituals from the perspective of the beginning, how you onboard new people. Really important right now, given that many people haven't even met their, mm -hmm. their peers, given that we're all remote. Rituals around meetings, rituals around taking a break, rituals around rewards and recognition, celebrating birthdays. So there's this whole um, roadmap, which is why that's what I call yeah. the book, of where there are opportunities. So mm -hmm. I can give a million examples and you can feel free to direct me if there's certain ones that you loved. But one of the ones that jumps out at me that literally there is no practical purpose um, is mm -hmm. at Allbirds, uh, the cool felt sneaker company where, you know, rituals can be top down, you know, David Millstone yeah. can come and, and organize a ritual, or they can be bottom up, inside out, they can come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so this ritual in particular was a guy that started at Allbirds and was having some health issues. He went to the doctor and he set a goal for himself that he was going to do, you know, a thousand pushups between now and the end of the year. And he divided it by the number of days left in the year. And he decided right. to do 40 pushups every day right. between now and the end of the year. He started doing him at work and everybody joined in and it became this very organic and authentic ritual called 40 at four. Mm -hmm. And the fun part now, because I was able to circle back before the book published um, in the middle of COVID and say, well, yeah. wow, all these rituals were in person. What are you doing now? Mm -hmm. And they're, and they're doing it online. And so, you know, there's no practical purpose, but what right. that ritual did for this culture in the moment was that people stopped, they took a break, they hung out with it. You know, it's like the, the days mm -hmm. of the old smoke breaks right, where people right. got to know each other as people. They, they, they were productive. I'd bump into you doing your push-ups, and right. I wouldn't have to send you 12 emails later in the day. Right. And I love the story you relayed about the New York Times coffee cart because, and you know, coffee, um, cheers. Um, coffee has a, a you know, um, uh, you know, you talk a lot about coffee in your book because, you know, coffee is one of our most ritualized activities. It came up in Bring Your Human. It, it you know, came up in, in revisiting Starbucks in, in this book. But, um, but it, it's interesting because, you know, that, that coffee cart story, maybe you can relate that, really distinguished something which 
everybody could do all the time at any moment from, you know, um, but, but, but truly turned it into a ritual that, that connected people, right? I mean, people can get up anytime and go get coffee, but, you know, to create a ritual out of it actually had effect and it was missed when it was lost. Right. And that's, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, that's yeah. a really important part of a ritual that people, you know, if all of a sudden it went away, people would be, you know, some people told me in the course of this that they thought maybe the company was going to be sold if a certain ritual went away. Now, one right. thing I'll share with this group, it's not in the book because I, I didn't feel really comfortable putting it in there, but I'll share it today. Um, when I, the way that I learned about this New York Times ritual, and so the, I'll tell you what the ritual is, and I'll tell you how I found out about it, because it was really interesting. Um, there was a coffee cart that every afternoon at four o'clock, the coffee cart would show up and people got up, they got a muffin and got their coffee. But I say in the book, you know, it was much more than caffeine on wheels. You know, mm -hmm. this was a moment that people knew they were going to take a break and stand up and, you know, stretch and bond with their colleagues. And then literally one day there had been a restructuring and the coffee cart didn't come and mm -hmm. it, the impact that it had on people. So the way that it came out and this was, I did a talk during Bring Your Human to Work at the New York Times for their women's group. And at the time, um, Meredith Levian, who now is the CEO, you know, she was uh, probably the COO then, she was the executive sponsor. She was in the meeting. So I'm right. out there and I'm talking and all these women, you know, they felt pretty comfortable opening up. And finally, one woman literally raised her hand and she said, you know, what's going on with the coffee cart? You know, it's gone. And like the and you know, the impact on the people. And I'm I was just sort of sitting there, it was like a little uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. and that began that that conversation about the impact on the loss of these rituals and how, you know, rituals, they don't have to cost anything. I mean, you know, this costs a little, you put some snacks on yeah. it. The loss and the impact can can, you know, be priceless per se. Right, right. And how how have you found that the rituals are best developed? I mean, how do you find those moments that create authentic, organic rituals as opposed to, you know, something that that might feel stylized or, you know, the sort of the classic, oh, well, I'll do trust falls or something, right? Um, and 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 how, you know, um, and, and maybe, you know, some examples of rituals that have gone wrong, right? And 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 where it where it 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 doesn't work. So, you know, you never know what, where, when a ritual is going to stick. And mm -hmm. so what I tell leaders is, it's, you know, try not to take it personally. You know, <laughs> like tomorrow after our talk today, you know, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily recommend going in, okay, everybody, this is our new ritual. Okay, um, you know, it could <laughs> stick. But, yeah. but it very well might not. So some of the best rituals and the stickiest rituals are, and I, mean, I know we'll get to this, and one of the things I've been so impressed by with Standard is the focus on values. You know, mm -hmm. even, you know, the video that's on your website, you, you know, values make us who we are. I love that's that right. you have four values and not 14, right. um, way too many. And so the rituals that really are the most functional, that are meaningful, that, yeah. that have the longevity, are connected to your culture, to your sort of the soul of, of who you are. Now, the right. way that I was able to get to those, because I would say to leaders, so what are your rituals? And, and yeah. sometimes people knew, many times they had to hesitate, they weren't really sure. So mm -hmm. this is a question that I asked um, to, to begin to get underneath some of it. And the question is, I would say, so David, when do employees at Standard Industries feel most standard-ish? Right. Most like a standard employee. Mm -hmm. And so when I asked that question, for example, to Marisa Andrada, who's the CHRO at Chipotle, again, the light bulb went off and she said, oh, I know what it is. Every day at 10.15 in the morning, all the people working at Chipotle stop and they have a meal together before it opens. Mm -hmm. By the way, who would have guessed that Chipotle opens for lunch at 10.30, but I guess it's very <laughs> busy at 10.30 in the morning. Yeah. So, that, so you know, that, that's how I began to, to get at this. And rituals, they might come from the top, they might come from the bottom, they can really come from anywhere. And many times the person that started the ritual is not even with the company anymore but the right. ritual has lived on. Now, the flip side is, you know, a ritual that's gone badly. 
Um, you know, I have seen in some teams within an organization, even if it is linked to the values, I think it's a problem. And I started looking at this and bring your human to work, sort of how can rituals, um, you know, a human workplace is an inclusive workplace. Right. And if you have rituals that are only about going out and drinking or now doing, you know, a lot of people have been doing happy hours and mixologists. Yeah. I think that's great, but have a mocktail. Don't always do them, yeah. especially now after work at six o'clock because all of our kids are home. And so yeah. thinking about these rituals through the lens of all of the different kinds of people in our, in our organizations, you know, that's something to really think about. Yeah, I mean that's that's a very interesting point because you know there's a there's a moment where you know rituals can I mean rituals in so many ways can be you know in, in inclusive right and and you know the example after example in in your book of you know how they bring people um, you know together and, and companies together um, you know but there's also you know a history where you know certain rituals can be you know, um, can exclude people, right, in, in certain ways, right? You talk about a smoke break, for example, and, and you know, it's in, in sort of almost by definition sort of exclude, you know, a great ritual, but almost by definition exclusionary if, if you don't smoke or, or don't want to smoke or, or drinking, um, you know, and is, you know, in, in a moment where, you know, people are ever more conscious of, of creating an inclusive, you know, workplace, you know, what are, what are some of the things that sort of you can think about to navigate that um, the right way? I mean, I, I, you, you know, you gave a few, right? One is, is you know, the coming up with the breaks between um, work and home and, and, and you know, and, and maybe drinking, but, um, you know, how, how do you, and, and I think another question which is related is how important is it that, that, that rituals need to go from the top to the bottom of the organization versus being, organically part of, you know, small individual teams? Um, I think it's great when there's, when they are also yeah. part of individual teams. Um, and many organizations, especially this year, were thinking about what do they do with their holiday parties, for example. I was getting yeah. a lot of calls about that. And I, again, is I, what I would say and hope from a best practice standpoint is that they're still connected to the values, but mm -hmm. each team is different. And, you know, you could, if, and I know many people listening today are, are the leaders within your organization. Each person listening should think about that question as it relates to his or her group. When do people in my team feel most you know, connected to the team. And maybe it is when they do a trivia night, or maybe it is when they have do something on a Slack channel and, and really lean into that. But at the same time, I do think there's something really great. I know there's a lot of different businesses under the standard umbrella that what are a, one or two things a year yeah. really connects everybody. Yeah. Um, and, and brings everyone together. So we know that we all have our individual teams, maybe our individual businesses, but we're all part of this um, overall organization. And our mission is around, you know, building a better world and, yeah. and really connecting back, back to the mission. No, oh, it's exactly right. You know, it's interesting. That's, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, you know, people that stand are often feel most um, at home and in, in sort of in keeping with the spirit of our brand when we're focused on giving back, right? I mean, we, yes. we're building company, it's it's a focus on um, you know building as you say a, a you know a better world and you know putting putting roofs over people's head. But for for example, you know in 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 lieu of a holiday party, which you know we did not have this year, um, you know we gave you know every individual you know the ability to you know give back to a local charity of their choice, and you know we opened up our corporate campus and you know had. Uh, hundred, you know, many people on this phone, but hundreds of people participate because we have a, you know, an, a sort of enormous corporate campus in, um, you know, drive-through food banks. So COVID safe because, you know, it was impossible during COVID to, you know, for people who were food insecure to go to a food bank and stand in line and get food. So people would, would drive through, you know, in Parsippany and sort of this large corporate campus. Um, and, you know, working with, you know, local New Jersey organizations, but um, those, you know, so many of those sort of moments of, of giving back have, have, I think, been very defining for, you know, for, for, you know, for the people on this call. Um, well, it's connected to your, the value of inspiring yeah. 
and community matters. And yeah. what I love about that is you're focused on community matters outside of standard. And we are, we are connecting our employees to their local communities and yeah. giving them resources to do it. But it also is an opportunity to connect back internally um, to the internal community. Yeah. And I've written a few articles this year. I do think that if there is a year to focus on giving back um, and making that a ritual, and there's a lot of research that shows the impact on giving back and what that has on us as, as a person. And it helps to connect people back back to purpose. Yeah. And 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 it's a, it's 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 one of these questions about being, you know, it's a, we are a deeply local business, right? So it's a focus on the communities in in which we live and work, right? Um, and how you navigate both something that works for, you know, an organization at, you know, at a high level, but also, you know, connects people at that you know, that very local level with, you know, the, all the communities in which the plants operate and the people operate in which we're, you know, we're, we're building things. Um, so that, you know, that has been, you know, that, that's, that's certainly been a, you know, a key focus, but, but also a way as, as, as you say, to bring people together. What, talk, tell us the origin story of the Spaghetti Project, because I love this story and I want, you know, I, I think it, it, it relates in many ways too, I think the transformation we're going through um, now in terms of remote and partial remote work and, and having people together. But tell us that origin story um, because it's a great story. Yeah, no, thank you for asking. So when I was writing Bring Your Human to Work, I came across a study out of Cornell University and it was done by a professor named Kevin Niffen. And Kevin was studying team performance. You know, what makes one team higher performing than another team? And his father was a firefighter. And so Kevin grew up hanging out in the firehouse. And so he decided as part of his PhD to really do a deep dive on, on the firehouse culture and looking at them as teams. The, the short version of what he found was that the firefighters who were the most dedicated to the ritual of the firehouse meal sitting around the table, you know, bringing their whole selves, building trust with each other, it actually correlated with higher levels of performance and those firefighters saved more lives. Yeah. And so, you know, when you, there's my new phone in my apartment that I have no mm -hmm. idea how to turn off for mm -hmm. the record. Um, hopefully someone's answering it. I, um, so when I heard that story and, you know, in, in your unbelievable introduction of me and talking about me as a connector at work and setting up some marriages on the side, you know, I always, I knew this intuitively, but this study, um, you know, it was a goosebump moment to say, wow, there's this science to back it up. And I had no, a number of conversations with firefighters to help me, you know, I heard their stories of how they literally were able to put out fires and, and save lives because they were better connected to the people with whom they work. And I'm sure we've all had that experience when we you know, can finish each other's sentences. You know, we mm -hmm. save time, we're more productive. So I call my, my work the Spaghetti Project, which is a name um, after the stereotypical go-to meal in the firehouse of spaghetti yeah. and meatballs. <laughs> And how it's so interesting because, you know, the, I mean, uh, the most classic ritual in life that you talk about in, in, in your book a lot is, you know, having a meal with someone, right? Um, breaking bread, you talk about the importance of, of taking lunchtime, you talk about, you know, people who feel you, know, you need to get together for, for dinner, you talk about um, Dan Lubetsky, who, who, you know, we've had um, you know, on this, this, this very same series, you know, come talk about, about some of the things and how they made, you know, they would have someone who came in to make waffles in the morning. Um, and, but it, it's, it's a question I'm sort of, you know, kind of obsessed with right now. And I think, I think everybody is, is, um, you know, in, in, in an era of increasingly remote work, right, there, there, there's, it feels like there's something about that moment, that in-person moment of, of sharing a meal or, or being with someone physically that can't be replicated over, over Zoom. And so I'm first interested in, in you know, is, is that true? Do you feel that there's just, there, there, there is just, you know, something that, that we can't replicate and, and what is it? Um, and if so, you know, how do we, if we think we're going to a world of increasingly remote work, how do we manage that and navigate that? Okay, so first I will say as an aside, it's funny that you brought up Daniel Lubetsky. Yeah. 
um, because this morning he's putting out some, you know, he's in the book, as you said, and he's um, putting out some, some nice words on social media. But literally this morning I was going back and forth with his team and in the book, there's a whole discussion about they have they used to have Waffle Wednesday. And for those who at home make Belgian waffles, you know, rituals also have a lot to do with our senses, what we can smell, yeah. what we can feel like that that first cup of coffee in the morning, you know, going into our bloodstream. And when I went to visit Kind Snacks and I went there on Wednesday specifically to try these waffles, the woman that I was emailing with this morning was like, oh my God, like you just made me remember and think about Waffle Wednesday and miss it. And so <laughs> as an aside, um, you know, and it, you, there's a loss, you feel a loss for some of these rituals. So to, to your question about in-person versus remote, you know, I would much rather be, you know, sitting with you in person right now, you know, having this dialogue, you know, the body language and the energy, yeah. you know, I know, we're doing a good job right now, but hopefully we'll, we'll get, you know, people to agree with that, but it's not the same. That being said, I want to share an example from the book where I don't think it, it's, you know, if, if in person's at 10, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying every remote lunch can, is going to be a 10, but I do think there are some benefits, number one. And number two, I think we're going to have to think about this because remote work is is not going away. So the example is from the company Udemy and the online learning company. They have a very, very strong lunch culture. I visited them out in California. They have a huge cafeteria. Everybody stops what they do at noon and gets in line. And as an aside, I just kept thinking to myself, when on earth are we going to a big company cafeteria that's family styled, you know, with a buffet? Got <laughs> Probably yeah. not for like 10 years. Not, not in that um, no. <laughs> So yeah, that's going to be off the table. We're going to have to rethink our like grab and go lunch or, or something. So right. they also had a ritual though called lunch roulette, where every other Thursday, people in the company could volunteer to have lunch mm -hmm. with, with each other. And I know you've been doing some of these virtual coffees where you're paired with different people. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what they were doing with lunch roulette. And this was in person and they would, you know, they all go out to lunch instead of having it at the cafeteria and the company would pay for it. So I reached back out during COVID to Kara Alamano, who's the head of HR. And I said, so, you know, how is it going? I mean, it must really be mm -hmm. so weird. Everybody has lunch together for a gazillion years and now we're oh. all. She said, interestingly, we were getting a lot of inquiries about how we could maintain lunch roulette. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was skeptical because I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, another Zoom? Like, is mm -hmm, do I yeah. really, do I really, I mean, I'm, I'm being totally honest here. And what she said, and this is the, the magic of a ritual when it's yeah. connected to your values. So they were, what they would do is you could opt in to have lunch with five mm -hmm. colleagues. They try to keep them in the same time zone. So somebody's not having breakfast while somebody else having lunch or dinner. And they would send, and, and I, it reminded me of your community focus, where they give people a gift card to order in from a local restaurant, and they felt people felt so good about supporting their neighborhood, you know, pizza place or sandwich place. So hopefully it still exists, you know, when this pandemic is over. And what struck me though, and and was it wasn't just another Zoom that because it was that idea of there was more meaning, this elevation yeah. of. There's a purpose behind this. We're just yeah. not getting on here to do some work while we eat or eat while we do mm -hmm. some work. This is our lunch roulette ritual that the purpose is to connect with people in the company, you know, in different groups. And we know that's a part of our culture. No one was multitasking. People were really leaning into it. The employee engagement scores were off the charts. They were measuring it and people can't get enough of it. And so yeah. it might not be for everyone, but it's a ritual that has that really sticks connected to their values. And I just, I believe that a Zoom is not a Zoom is not a Zoom. And so if right. you put some intention behind it, and, and this happens to be one where people can opt in. So there's probably some mm -hmm. self-selection in that anyway. I do think it can work. The last thing I'll say on this question is that as we start to go back or partially go back, I, I believe, and, and I'm so curious to be, you know, I want to continue these conversations about how we're going to do this, that I don't, I worry that we could create almost this two-class system, you know, this group going back, yeah. this group not, group not going back. And so 
we need to be even more intentional. You know, maybe we're not allowed to go back five days a week. You know, maybe yeah. we go back in a certain way where on Wednesdays, everybody's there and that's a ritual. And that's when we all connect or teams go on different days. I have no idea. Um, you know, I'm going to have to call people like you to tell me how it's going. But I do think rituals can be a tool that, that we can leverage to do this in a way that's inclusive and productive and, and enables us to maintain our values. Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of, I think, our big and the big concerns, right, is, I mean, you describe it, I think, correctly as a two-tiered system, but the if, if individuals connect more in person um, and certain people have more of an ability to get to work or, or be present somewhere in person and other individuals don't, um, by, you know, by virtue of personal circumstance outside their control, right. um, then, um, you know, then, you know, do you create, you know, a, a two tiered system where, you know, the, you know, it, it going back to kind of the rituals we were trying to avoid of yeah. people in the club, excluding people outside the club. Um, and how do we, you know, in, you know, very intentionally use rituals to, um, you know, to overcome that. I, I, I'm, I'm not even saying you have the answer, but I think it's, it's, it's the question we all need to yeah. wrestle with right now. Yeah. Well, interestingly, in that same in-person meeting at the New York Times, yeah. when we were talking about ways to bring your human to work, one woman raised her hand and said, one of the things they used to do was um, some of the group was remote and some were in person. And once, it's a once, what did she say? It was a once a week meeting slash call one week a month, even the people in the physical office who were co-located went back to their own cubicles to call in so that everybody was remote. It was sort of this yeah. equalizer to raise that level of empathy to remember what it's like when, when you're not in person. Yeah. So I think it's gonna be things, pieces of it like that. Maybe. Okay, three three questions, and I, I want to give you know some some time for the audience, and I I, I will encourage everybody to submit questions um, Q and A or, or you know to Dan um, uh, uh, for for the end. Um, uh, one is you know being a global business, um, you know it feels very hard to have rituals that work you know globally across you know very different cultures, time zones, continents. Um, you know, any thoughts on things you've seen that, that, that seem to work on, on a global basis? Yeah. I mean, one, I do think even for people that have these team meetings with a global team, we need to rotate the time zone just mm -hmm. from the standpoint of, of, you know, being fair to everybody. But I spoke to, um, a CEO, the company third love, which is the online, you know, big competitor to, um, you know, the bra company. Um, to Victoria's Secret, and they have something called Donut Tuesday, and they're global. They have China and, and um, somewhere in South America and the U.S., and what they told me is every Tuesday, everybody gets these donuts, and they're taking pictures, and it, it's like as the sun comes up in these different locations, people are posting pictures. So, you know, China is then connected to Chile, which is then connected to California, and they kind of go in order as everybody yeah. comes up. And what I loved about that was they're leveraging, it doesn't all have to be on Zoom. They're leveraging um, their technology to connect people and they're using Slack mm -hmm. and they're using photos and telling stories. And so, you know, I think where there's a will, there's a way. And, and, it, and that for them was a way it's global and everybody in each country did it in their own way, but there was a connection across. Mm -hmm. Um. So um, actually, I, I want to get to some of these some of these questions. So uh, my my last question for you, which is maybe about rituals, but not about rituals. Um, I was I was sharing um, with uh, um, you earlier that my wife and I met in and didn't meet, but but got to know each other in a myth and ritual class, which reminded me last night. Um, and you've you've successfully set up a lot of people. So and there's there's a lot of people now. Um, looking to get out post pandemic. Um, any, any advice on what works on connecting people on a personal basis and not just a, a corporate basis? Uh, I'm glad I'm not, you know, in my 20s dating <laughs> right now, I have to say. Um, what I, you know, I guess I get this question as it relates to personal and dating, but also, also around networking. You know, yeah. the people, how do we continue? 
to build relationships in in this pandemic. And, you know, again, whether it's in any way, shape or form. And to me, you know, left to our own devices, again, we're not going to do it. You know, one of the things that happened during the quarantine for me was that I thought I'd have all these time, all this time to connect with people. And then I wasn't commuting. I had been on airplanes every week. And all of a sudden, though, I'm in this pandemic up in Connecticut. The day goes by. And I don't even know where it went. So I started, I actually made a ritual for myself and started something new where I would connect with two women in my life every week um, and checking in with people, see how I could be helpful. I started, you know, mm. offering to do coaching um, once a week, you know, a, from a pro bono perspective. So I sort of built that in. So again, whether it's dating, whether it's networking, you know, to me, if you're not intentional and in building in ways to do it, joining new organizations, um, to kind of just stay connected in general, um, we're not going to do it. And, you know, this pandemic has led to quite a bit of, of loneliness and depression and huge mental health issues. And that's for people who are living alone. And that's for people who yeah. are living with five people. I mean, we are all are yeah. feeling a sense of loneliness. So I would yeah. build it into your schedule. You know, one woman shared recently that every week she's in New York and, and her, one of her close friends is in Washington, DC. And during the pandemic, they went for a walk in separate cities and talked on the mm -hmm. good old fashioned phone and they got their steps in and felt connected to each other and they were outside in nature. So, so what I would say, and it goes back to why this book is called Rituals Roadmap. I would love for people, and I know we'll jump into these, these great questions on here, but think about it from two perspectives, the employee life cycle perspective that I mentioned, but on a personal level, how can you design your own rituals roadmap? And the question I would love for everyone to think about is, does your calendar reflect your values? Mm -hmm. And that can help drive, you know, how to begin spending your time and where you can insert rituals into your yeah. life. Yeah. Um, excellent. So let me jump into some of these questions because, um, so one, um, I, I feel terrible about this. At GAF, we, we had, this was Jeremy Messina, we had uh, Bagel Fridays, which we miss now. I don't know if we, I hope we didn't cancel them, but it reminded me of the story from your book. But to, could you just share briefly the, the story about, about the, the bagel days? Because we, we have to get yeah. those reinstated when we're all together again. Yeah, well, and Dan, Dan was on the launch last night. So Bill Konigsberg actually came. He's the yeah. CEO. Horizon Media, and he, you know, shows up on the screen. I'm like the bagel guy, bagel guy. So Bill, Horizon Media is 30 years old, and they mm -hmm. just last year had their 30th anniversary. And when they had 12 people, he started Bagel Friday, and he said it cost them five dollars. Now they have 3,000 people. And when I asked him that question, when did people mo feel most Horizon Media ish? It was Bagel Friday. Yeah. And, you know, but they're struggling with it too. How can we, how can we do the bagels right yeah. now? And, you know, I think some of them is realizing this loss, you know, and as Jerry said, you know, we miss them now. And so, you know, maybe people can, you know, you can think about creative things to do. I mean, maybe once a month, you know, everybody gets bagels and, you know, I'm not, you know, the company, you know, supports the bagels or maybe people that like bagels in there in, that happen to eat them anyway, take a picture, you know, and post it and put it on some type of intranet thing just to keep people connected in GAF around this idea of bagel or here I had yeah. a bagel or here, you know, who knows? There's so many, again, it's, it's, it can be that the, the, the touch point of reminding people we like who we work with. We miss everybody. We can't wait to get back. And yeah. those moments had meaning. Yeah. Um, Dorit had saw you actually um, saw you at uh, UJA Professional Women's Talk a few years back, talking about bringing a human to work, um, which she loved, and was asking about um, under the current circumstances, are there any aspects of that book that you would reconsider? You know. Uh, from that, you know, given current pandemic, remote work, or just changes, I mean, I'll add just changes that you've seen as the world has evolved since you since you wrote that book. Wow, I love that question. So I would actually double down on bringing your <laughs> work. And what I would say is that the leaders right now that are able to motivate their team and the, the, to have their employees feel engaged and connected are bringing their human to work 
more than they ever have before. And not everybody is comfortable with it. So I say to people, you know, I'm not, you don't have to give me a 180, but you know, maybe a little. So what do I mean by that? Um, you know, especially being here in New York City, a lot of people work in very, very small spaces. You know, their their desks are in the same room as their bed and, and it's hard and people want to get back to the office, but we also have to be safe. And leaders who've been able to be almost and even vulnerable about like, this isn't easy for them as well. And here's something that is going on in my life that, you know, that we're all experienced. This pandemic is happening to all of us in very different ways. And so, you know, with Bring Your Human to Work, there's always been the, the leaders who have felt that this kind of stuff is touchy-feely and it's not bottom line oriented and, you know, sort of just push it to the side. Um, but many of them have come back now because what they're realizing is if you're on a remote call and, and you have a deliverable with a client or you're working on a project that is mission critical and you're, you know, you're looking at everybody on these squares and they're not being open and honest with you about what's really going on with them. How are you as the leader going to know, you know, maybe I shouldn't give David this mission critical project today yeah. because you know, he's having these things going on in his life. And so, so I think it's bringing your human to work is exponentially more important. And then the bonus here is that the rituals can help leaders get there. So in the example I just gave, leaders are sharing with me that in the beginning of their meetings, you know, one of the questions that I often get is, do I need to keep checking in like enough already? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is 10 months. In the beginning of the pandemic, I'm sure many of you saw this with your own teams, people were checking in for 20 minutes of a 45 minute meeting because we were all scared out of our minds. Um, we can't continue to spend most of our meeting doing that. We have work to get done, but the flip side is we still need to check in. So what are some rituals yeah. that have been built? You know, one is everybody go around and give a one word description that describes how they are showing up in that moment, in that day. Mm -hmm. and then as the leader gives you an opportunity, A, to follow up with that person later to say, geez, David, like what's going on? If you, you know, tell everybody that you're beyond frustrated and B, it allows the leader to say, all right, David, you know what? We're going to put, you know, Dorit on this project with you um, to help you. And, and leaders that yeah. aren't human aren't going to get that intel, which is why mm -hmm. the subtitle of that book and rituals too are good, are important for people and for business. Yeah. I mean, given, given your emphasis on, on, you know, the importance of in-person connectivity and, and that thank God this pandemic will be over sooner or later, do you, do you think that remote work is not going away? I mean, is it possible that remote work actually fades because, because people need that human connectivity? I think it, I, I think it's not going away. Um, yeah. And I think there's been some real amazing things that have come out of it. I mean, we've learned that we actually can do this. We can get our work done. And so the days of, and I hope of, you know, FaceTime, not FaceTime on our phones, that way our mm -hmm. kids all go FaceTime, but, you know, the making sure I get in so that people can see me in the office, which, you know, there are still many leaders that kind of had that, you know, right. out of sight, out of mind, you know, I really want to see people. So I was yeah. never a big fan of that for many women, um, stereotypically, of course, you know, there are stay-at-home dads as well. Mm -hmm. but, you know, many women left the workforce because of that, you know, FaceTime thing. So I think right. there are some real positives. However, we are human, we are born right. to connect. And so we need to find opportunities to come into the office. You know, the CEO of Google had, did a talk recently where he said that we are still, many of us, living off that relationship capital that we built when we knew each other face to face. But yeah. what happens yeah. when that runs out and it's starting to run out, that we have people yeah. on our team, yeah. sometimes like half the team, we've have, they've never met each other in person and we're going to begin to see the impact of that. Exactly. Um, Alex Randall, do you, do you have any personal anecdotes or is there research to suggest that businesses that run company sports or wellness competitions, you know, some, something physical in particular, feel more connected to each other um, and, you know, more psychological safety, which we didn't even get to the three Ps, but more psychological safety in the workplace? 
you know, specific to sports, I'm going to have to look, Alex, and see. I, I there's I have anecdotes from from companies in Bring Your Human to Work. There's a whole chapter in the book called Be Well, and it's all about rituals around wellness, which I'm a huge fan of. And now with the destigmatization of mental health and you know the importance of that, I am seeing more and more wellness rituals. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the competition thing, it, it's almost, it might work, it might not. It depends on your culture. It could be like the drinking thing. You know, it's like, oh, I don't want to go out and feel like I have to, you know, throw the football. Um, you know, I'm personally a big, a big fan of that, but I think it's team specific. I think it's group specific. And the example I gave of the 40 at four pushups at Allbirds, what ended up happening was the ritual was about the pause and the mm -hmm. break in the day. And there were the push-up people. And then there were the people that watched the push-ups and the people that got their coffee and brought their coffee to the push-ups. So, you know, it, it sort of, it sort of um, morphed. But I do think wellness as a ritual um, is hugely important and growing, mm -hmm. um, you know, in popularity right. every day because we need to get people in our organizations to pause and focus on self-care. Right, right. Um, from Steph Shaw, I, you know, any focus on the differences in the impact between personal versus team-based rituals and do we need both? I mean, we talked a little bit about personal rituals at the beginning and I mean, you were a gymnast, right? Did you have ritual before? I mean, I, I know every time before a race, I like hold my goggles in one hand and put them on the same way. I mean, to your point, it's, it's not purposeful. It's just a ritual. Yeah. Did you, did you have a ritual? And I mean, how important are those kind of personal rituals versus team-based rituals and, and you know, the interplay between them? So that's a great 70 segue into why are ritual, you know, I, I have um, something in the book called the three P's of rituals. Why should we care? Like, why are we having this conversation about rituals? This is what rituals do for us. One, they ground us. They create some order out of chaos, which is even more important right now in these turbulent times of, of COVID. Um, and the three Ps are you know, really an overview of all the science and the data that I uncovered in terms of the benefits of rituals. So the first P is psychological safety. That rituals give us that safety. They give us these, these points of connection. The second P is purpose. That rituals give us an opportunity to connect to our values. It could be our own personal values or it could be our, our company values and our, and our team values. Add those two together and you get performance. You know, performance could be um, individual performance, our stress goes down, our cortisol, our oxytocin, that feel-good hormone yeah. goes up, or it could be team performance, that that um, people that work at organization, at what they call high trust organizations, organizations where you feel psychologically safe, are 47% more collaborative and 50% more productive. And so there's science behind the impact of both our own rituals to us as people and, and to our rituals as a team. So I think it's an individual, it's, it's, it's where in your life can rituals make you feel most like you, whether it's your morning coffee ritual, which I talk about in the book a lot. Mm -hmm. For me, I can't imagine a day without my coffee ritual. It could be over a meal like the firefighters. It could be taking the the non-smoke break or the having the dark chocolate or going for a walk in the afternoon. A huge one right now I'm doing, next week I'm doing a lot of Instagram lives. I'm doing sort of this road show. And I'm talking to one woman about um, a new ritual that I've seen popping up all over, which is called the faux commute. That as much mm -hmm. as people hated commuting, now they're like, wow, there are aspects of commuting and that ritual of commuting that I miss. It's when I listen to that 25 minute podcast. You know, it's when I did my meditation. And now, you know, if they're home with kids or if they're home with, you know, their spouse, I mean, my husband, I am like, why won't you go to the office? Like, I can't do my morning ritual because you won't go to the office. So it's, um, yeah, there's, there's a big impact. And I, I think we need both, but, um, and one tends to impact the other. Mm -hmm. um, so two, two last questions, I'll, I'll, I will make them quick because this is a, we, we could go on at the volume of which questions are hitting my inbox, we could go on for a long time and probably 
should do this feel again in, in smaller feel groups. Free to, feel free to send them to me if we don't get to them, and I will answer them, and you can contribute uh, them. And 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 we should do it in person uh, and with spaghetti. Um, uh, you know, one is is um, you know from from uh, Gerald Lackey, but just about the if you seen the value of rituals in in changing behavior, right, in driving um, not just not just connectivity per se, right, but but influencing positive behaviors. For example, you know, I found you know we we used to our plan, you know, our teams would always start meetings talking about safety, for example, right, because safety was was so critical, but. You know, I, I would think of that as a behavioral ritual, you know, that was really intended to, you know, um, and we talk about values, but but rituals in, in the context of driving behavior. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I both personally and with the team. So one place where I saw this quite frequently was in the chapter on meetings. I mean, to your yeah. point, talking about safety in the beginning of a meeting, mm -hmm. and Eileen Fisher, the clothing company, they ring a chime before a meeting and it helps everybody take everything external that was going on and sort of take a moment to to settle you know many organizations these days have been doing um taking a few deep breaths with everybody on their team before they start the meeting because we're all running and things are so crazy right now and that's a new ritual that has come up for for many people um, so that's you know because rituals ground us so i saw it a lot in in meetings that chapter i saw it in you know even rec even around recognition right. that, that you know we're all we're feeling stressed and we're feeling disconnected and these rituals around you know celebrating milestones or the end of the week i i mm -hmm. could really see um see a shift in behavior and a and almost like a you know your shoulders are up here and kind of you know, bringing the shoulders back down and reminding people, wow, this is why I, what I, you know, why I do what I do and connecting people back to purpose. Um, I've seen it firsthand. Well, look, that's, that, I think that's, that's a good place to end because we are, we are out of time and over time, but I will volunteer, you know, to, to, to host uh, um, some spaghetti and meatballs, um, even though I don't eat meat, but at least spaghetti. Um, for, I had, pressure, uh, I had yeah. vegan meatballs. So I am a um, free. For, I'm gluten free. For, for a group of people with with Erica to talk about this, um, and um, you know, because I, you know, I, I have found is and and your book only highlights the, you know, the the absolute you know sort of critical nature of of you know finding those moments to connect and and you know there's I don't think there's any better way than than sitting and sharing a meal so. Um, we should all do that, but thank you. Congratulations um, on on the book. Where you know we're very excited, and you know for everybody on the phone, um, you know please you know send send questions, and we'll we'll get them to Erica. And I apologize if we didn't didn't get to them uh, today.